are you guys doing today? Good. How are you? Good. I, uh, I can't complain. I'm super happy that you guys are able to join us on this new episode of Collider Connected. Um, so let me just start with the most basic for the two of you, which is um, what, what have the last few weeks been like for you guys? I don't, you know, for me, we're we're living in uh, Henderson, Nevada, right now, and so when I am here, it's kind of like a lot of video calls and uh, remote, you know, work. So that has been not that much different. But um, and luckily, everyone in the family is ha- is healthy, so I I can't complain. We're in a we're in a really good spot. Chad, hi, hi. <laughs> I am still in Los Angeles, where every day is painstaking, begrudgingly hours of trying to write the next John Wick. (laughs) So that that hasn't slowed down, pandemic or not. That's that's what's good about, you know, I guess getting the window of time. I guess you can sit, as creatives, you get some time to just sit and think about it without the pressure of like, hey, we're going to make this thing tomorrow. Yeah. But with the added pressure that if it sucks, boy, there's no excuse because we've had plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing. It's like, man, we should have done something this week. Right, we could have done something better. Yeah. No, a lot, a lot of people have talked about, though, um, a lot of filmmakers have said that one of the pressures of the studio system is that, you know, you have a release date and you got to make that release date. And with this pandemic, with everyone being home, it's allowing a lot of people to work on screenplays and story elements for a longer period of time than maybe they typically would have. Yeah, I think sometimes that's good. Sometimes you mull it over too much. But um, I don't know. For us and our little team, it's been great. I mean, we've had a lot more time to develop and research. So it's been, you know, all the other drama notwithstanding, it's been a good creative process. It was a good time to work on your process. Like I, because I was doing back-to-back movies, like the four movies in five years and development was always put on the back burner. So again, like problem opportunity, this is not a, wouldn't wish this situation on the world at all, but it has provided me a time where I could think about development, work with writers, you know, we can, you know, Kelly and I can, you know, creatively get stories together and it's, it's been great that way, so. Um, I have a lot of things that I want to talk to the two of you guys about, but I want to jump into something that, okay, I'll, um, as a lot of people know that we do a Collider screening series, and one of the screenings that I've been trying to pull off for forever, I mean years, is Speed Racer. And um, I had a whole plan, I've been, and maybe we're still going to do it, but because we're in this quiet moment, I want to share with people that love Speed Racer the way I love Speed Racer, a lot of people don't realize that you were both very involved in that movie. And um, I really want you guys to like reveal, if you will, what you both did um, on the film. Jeez. Um, that's, how long ago was that? Um, that was after the assassin before Cloud Atlas, I think, right? Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, I was brought in to be the stunt coordinator. And I, you know, we'll get into it later about, how many units? I think we had four units running in that. The way it was shot was in layers, just like almost like an anime. You had uh, James Batiste, uh, what? You had the Wachowskis doing first unit, the foreground. You had James Batiste doing all the gimbal and car stuff, which is the second layer. Uh, Dave and I were on like third unit, and then you had the VFX assets being done on a fourth unit. So literally the entire movie is every scene is being shot four times with four different units, depending on the layering process. So every director had to get together every morning, every day, and (laughs) kind of get their shit together and figure out what you're shooting, and you'd work with overlays. And I think, what, how many parts? I think Dave played like eight or nine parts on that, (laughs) Uh, in addition to doing all the stunts. And uh, you can see Dave in almost every group shot in that thing, I think. Uh, But it was really fun. It was like no one had ever shot a film like that before with the VFX layering to give it that anime background, wipey look that you see in so many great Japanese animes. And... uh, I don't know. God, it was a little trial and error from the beginning, but I think it wasn't. It was like every day we had to check in with everybody. I mean, it was pretty yeah, see, like what what assets had been checked off and who was shooting what sections. But I would say when everyone was going to everyone was trying 3D and 3D was exploding, you know, the Wachowskis were trying to do something 
you know, in the spirit of, you know, the animes that they loved that translated to cinematically to the screen. And that's what we really liked about it. And so there's this 2D, 3D pop up book element to that that's really compelling. And again, like, I don't think that movie gets enough credit, especially for all the love and uh, artistry that went into it on all the department's levels. Like, Chad, yeah. we, the choreography we did for the, the ninja fight or the nanja fight uh, was probably some of our, the most fun we've ever had in making a movie. <laughs> so. No, it was just like Dave said, it was film school all over again, because just when you think you know how to do layers and composites, uh, you know, the VFX team brought in a new methodology that we all tried to, to do. And it was, I don't know, to work that closely again with the Wachowskis going to film school was, you know, for those six months was pretty, pretty, uh, I think most of what Dave and I know from compositing and doing advanced VFX shots come from that era. Yeah. You know? Well, one of the things about that film, which, which a lot of people don't realize, if you've never, first of all, if you've never seen Speed Racer, it's phenomenal, and anyone watching this should go watch it tonight. But the thing that's so genius about it is how they figured out how to have everything in focus, whether it be the foreground or the background. It that's was, it it's yeah. you know, just revolutionary. Yeah. And you, you got to remember, like, you know, we're dealing with a chimpanzee. I don't know if you ever work with chimpanzees, but they're not the most friendly. <laughs> primate you know so the chimpanzee anytime it was around you know our younger cast was separated so that was a layer within the layer within the layer within the layer and that's how they kept the infinity focus going and all and all the stuff because every layer was shot independently you know pretty uh pretty genius actually um uh i would imagine oh, sorry. actually one thing to the creating of the environments like the worlds that we were in they were doing what they were doing were these camera arrays which now everybody uses like you were you go and shoot an array of a of a of an environment you know like you lidar a set they would do that and create like a two-dimensional layer so you could we could yeah. you know basically put the camera anywhere and you had this we call the bubble of the world and so they sent that effects unit around the world to get all of these environments and shooting these arrays and that was really before anyone was using it um the technology that way and it was again like there were so many inventive things that yeah, came they, out of that I, think, I think they sent a unit to Iceland, to Switzerland. I think they were compiling all these different bubbles. environments yeah. To, yeah, all, to, to get the bubbles going. So even after we were done with principal photography, there are still units going out and shooting the bubbles everywhere. I mean, a, a phenomenal amount of work went into that. Again, I agree with you, Steve. I, I don't think the movie gets enough credit for no. its artistry. You know? I mean, I, I don't yeah. know if you ever do it again today if somebody ever want to go through that kind of work. And yeah. a great, like, message, sorry. Like, and sort of a great story and a great family message and, like, you know, about, you know, the small, the little guy and, like, sort of the mom and pop shops, like, thriving over the big corporation. And, like, there's a really good message in the middle of it, too, that people can take away. And it's, I don't know, you don't get to do those that often. And yeah, my, my, pl my plan, just in case we can ever pull it off, um, and one of the reasons when people are watching are probably like, well, how come you didn't do Speed Racer? Well, you guys are normally very, very busy trying to get you guys and also trying somehow to get the Wachowskis and, you know, trying to pull it all off is um, challenging. Um, but I have every intention of doing a special IMAX screening with you guys and with them as if we can finally pull it together um, and get some of the cast. I swear I want this to happen more than anything. Be good to see some of the cast and we had a great cast yeah yeah um so i want to um i know we've talked a little bit about the wachowskis uh, but we're going to go even further so um chad i believe you worked on all three matrix movies and david you worked on reloaded no and, and Re two. Oh, so you worked on both yeah, so uh, so chad i want to start with you you're you're working on the first matrix movie which at the time is another groundbreaking revolutionary movie. When you're working on that thing at the time, did you have any idea what they were gonna be able to pull off with the action and the visuals? Or were you sort of like, because it was, it was so groundbreaking? Uh, no, no and no. Um, That's not true. That's not true. I, well, I, I wanted a gig. We didn't know what it was. It was, a, it was Dublin Keanu, so I'd been through a couple auditions. The first audition was no. I didn't know what I was getting into, but then, at the audition, no one, had, no one had told me that it was Yung Wu Ping. And I got there and I thought I recognized him. And then I found out, oh, it's Yung Wu Ping. 
and the entire team that did Fist of Legend. I mean, it's Jet Li's stunt team, basically, and his choreography team. And Yung Wu Ping is famous from Jackie Chan to Jet Li. So that's when I got back and, and called Dave and a few other friends. We're like, holy shit, this, you know, this is going to be something. But well, let, I, me, let me interrupt this one. Let me interrupt because you call, I talked to you from Australia. I remember talking to you oh, when yeah, you were down right. there working yeah. and you were like, you don't understand, dude. Like you were already putting the pieces together. Like they, you know, this is how you were, we were, you were already thinking about like, this is revolutionary. People have never seen this. It is so cool. And it's either going to be like blow people's mind or people are never going to get it. And then, uh, um, we were such fans of, you know, Hong Kong cinema. Like we used to sit when we were coming up as stuntmen, like cut all, we would cut all the fight scenes of the, the classics together and just watch them in a run. Not and you just skip the narrative. It was just like watching rows and rows of fight scenes. So he's working with like our favorite choreographers and our favorite stuntmen. And so now you can finish. Cause I'm like, you were already thinking it when you were there. So. I would say, I mean, I, I keep telling people I turned the job down twice. I know. was, you know, I just couldn't, I was, I was doubling, I was doubling, what was it, Michael Weiss on The Pretender on this TV series I'm for Pretender. NBC, TV show. and it was, it, it, for, I mean, I forget too, I was only 25, and that was a good gig, man, I was making decent money doubling this guy on a regular show, and then they tell me it's, you know, Keanu Reeves and some sci-fi kung fu movie, and you gotta remember, kung fu and martial arts were not, that was strictly a low-budget thing, there were no big-budget martial art movies ever, period, and you know, it was all Schwarzenegger and Stallone doing one punch, boom, and the guy would fall down. So finally, the schedules worked out because Keanu had a neck injury. So they pushed the fight scenes till the next year, till February. I got a call back from Barry Oswald, the producer, saying, hey, we've pushed the fight schedule. Now are you available? And I went, yeah, actually, I'm, I'd love a free trip to Australia. That'd be great. And I was in Sydney, Australia. So I got there, and literally a weekend, that's when, you know, it picks up with Dave's story going, yeah, this is kind of next level shit. And then it's still, even after all that, and I spent six months there, it wasn't until six months later that year when, you know, I was at the premiere and it was in Westwood, California. You know, I saw it in the opening fight scene with Trinity. Like, no one, you don't see it on set at the time. We didn't have all the playback and stuff that we do now. When you see the colors, the music, and you're like, literally, I mean, still the biggest premiere I've ever been to with the audience reactions. After Trinity's first fight scene, it was in a premiere, which, you know, it's all industry people. It was a standing ovation, like in the first action scene of the movie like 800 people stood up and applauded like that's 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 unheard of that's freaky so no uh didn't just <laughs> my best guess did i think it was be as cool as it was i mean it's hard because like dave and i will tell you we have a a team of you know stuntmen that range from a very similar age and we are all the way down to like 20 something year olds we have very young team members on our, our stunt teams and stuff and you know, we were there when Matrix opened. Now they see Matrix as a retro film. And it's, you know, it's very easy to forget <laughs> that there was nothing like the Matrix before it came out. The martial arts, the wire work, the look, the feel, the vibe, the slickness, the coolness. And now because everything from superhero movies to assassin movies to sci-fi movies, everybody's copied it. It's very hard to see some kind of sci-fi action movie or even superhero movie that hasn't ripped off or borrowed from the Matrix in some way. Hero so landing nowadays. The Matrix isn't special. The Matrix. They. We just showed it to a couple of our our younger guys for the first time. They've seen it this year, and they're like, "Eh, you know, it looks like." We're like, "No, dude, this came before Avengers. You don't understand. <laughs> this was unheard of at the time." You know, I think the first one still holds up the best. I think, and it's still my favorite by far. It's just. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's that was an incredible, what was it, seven years between all three of them, six years, something like that. Um, it's an incredible learning. The other thing about The Matrix is it came out, I believe, in 99, which is when the internet was going, but it was not the internet that we all know. You know, there was no video, there was no, tr you couldn't sell the film the way you sell things now. So people went to see the movie in the theater and had no effing idea what they were getting. They saw the newspaper ad going, you know, one shot again, I'm like, okay, let's go see it. It was, uh, you know, even trailers. So you go back and watch, go type in the, the early trailers for the TV trailers. You're kind of like, ah, it looks cool, but it looks a little weird. You they were know? selling the mystery. Like, I think billboards were like, what is the Matrix? Like, you would never run a campaign like that. And I now, now you want to, you now the trailers are, give them more. Yeah, tell them the whole movie. Show them the more of the movie, the more you're going to get the audience in. That's frustrating for filmmakers like us, but that's kind of the new model. It's like, and there they were like, what is the Matrix? That's it. Some code on a billboard, and you're like, crazy. Completely. 
Um, I, I have to ask you, so we, we've talked a lot about the Wachowskis, but I, I think they're geniuses. Like, I, I can't say enough good things about the Wachowskis. And I wanted to know, as filmmakers, what did you glean from working with them that maybe you've taken with you to this day? Oh, geez. There's a lot. I mean, the look, the, I think the biggest thing, not only like their visual style and like the fact that they really sort of like graphic composition and um, there's this, you know, beautiful visual storytelling that some directors, you know, aren't in tune with. That's one of the things. But all, the biggest thing I think is like the, they're risk takers and they they um, they're bold filmmakers and they they're not afraid. And I think that they always taught us to, you know, you know, swing for the fences and be bold and take risks and and make big choices because that's how films get remembered. I mean, there's plenty of programmer films out there that are derivative of something else. But um, if you can make something original every time out, win or, you know, win or lose or draw, they try to make something that's original and it's from them as artists. And that's um, because they're risk takers. I mean, that's I, Chad, I don't know what you're are you, uh, It's weird. It's like they <clears throat> after Jesus, I think six, seven films with them. I, I think it's bored into your creative DNA from the biggest to the smallest, meaning um, like Dave said, the meants on Sen, the detail they give from the biggest to the smallest thing. I remember walking on set after I'd got to know him a little better towards the end of the first Matrix, and in between shots, they're at the monitors and they're watching the fashion channel, you know, runway models. And I was like, I used to, you know, being the dude and the stunt guy, kind of gave him a little shit. I'm like, what are we doing, boys? You know, no basketball on or something like that, you know? And they're like, and they, without a beat, they're like, no, look at the, look at the curves, look, watch when she moves, watch the way the dress flows around her. That says, and you. And I got suckered in this conversation about the lines of this particular Italian model's dress, about what it said, from power to structure to form. And you're just like, wow. I, it immediately clicked in my brain, shut up and listen. There's something smart to be learned here. you know. And now as a director, you realize that everything is everything. How you do anything is how you do everything, from the smallest to the biggest. So like from what Day was saying, the, the overall thematic of swing for the fence and then the middle ground of the, the physical interpretation of, of composition and framing and color down to how a dress moves around a body to every word spoken. And they, no detail was too small for them and no thematic too big for them. And if you're gonna direct everything in front of that camera and everything behind that camera is your responsibility. You just, you don't phone in anything. You know, and that's, what, that's what makes the movie have its, what they would call authorship. You know, we all have our personalities into it. So hopefully, while seeing, like if you watch a John Wick movie, like say you take the first John Wick, you see a lot of Wachowski in that. How can you not? The frame, the colors, but hopefully you'll see it in an off-camera kind of view that you see a little Dave, you see a little Chad. It's interesting because you can watch the first John Wick and then you can go watch, you know, the second John Wick in Atomic Blonde and you can see a little bit more Dave in Atomic Blonde, you see a little bit more Chad in, I hate saying our names in the third person, but like, <laughs> Chad and that, like hopefully in each one you see a lot of Wachowski DNA. How can you not? Yes. They taught us how to be authors you know, and put our own little stink on things while still using their stuff. And I think that's probably the most definable characteristic I got from them. You know, the the other thing too, they they did empower us with the choreography, like they gave us a long leash all the time. Um, and then would come in and put their spin on the things that we did. Like we would shoot stunt viz for them, choreograph, shoot, edit, and then they would come in and sometimes shoot it a different way. And other times they'd be like, we love that, let's just shoot that. But um, what, the other thing that was interesting is you got to watch them change as filmmakers too, I think from Reloaded and Revolutions where we're doing crazy number of uh, takes per setup. And like one shooting, one, shooting those movies with one camera, not multiple cameras, like one camera, this is the angle we're focusing on. We're gonna do 30 to 60 takes of this till we get it right, perfect. And then approaching a movie um, later on, like Speed Racer, where we're shooting multiple cameras and we're shooting all these layers and like watching them grow and, and try things as filmmakers and getting to be there behind the curtain and seeing successes and failures. You can't even calculate how important that is to a filmmakers, you know, like the amount of knowledge we have from watching them experiment and being right there hands on with them. You know, that's part of who we are. Like, so we've seen the, the, you know, again, the successes and the failures and the experimentations. And um, again, they're, they, 
are fearless, which I love that. So completely. So uh, a bunch of more things I want to jump into, but a lot of people have heard about 8711 and they've heard 8711s involved in movies and crafting action or whatever it may be, but maybe don't realize you guys started 8711 and maybe don't know the history. So um, I kind of wanted to know, how did you guys first realize you wanted to start a, a company like that? And for people that aren't familiar with it, how do you typically describe it? Mm, well, it, go it really goes back to Chad coming back from the first Matrix. I think that's really when it started. And then was it after when it was, we had, decided, well, he was explaining how the Hong Kong team would train the actors and choreograph as a team and shoot and edit and present the finished product as choreography not separated from camera to the director. And um, we're like, we want to do that. So we were we rented a building in Culver City and we started to put our stunt friends together and we would just choreograph and shoot and choreograph. Uh Shoot and edit. Interrupt you, Dave. Like just so you know, or so your audience knows, uh, sometimes making movies or uh, like martial art movies or fight scenes in movies before we came back from the Matrix wasn't as sophisticated as people might think. It was literally if there was a fight scene on a Tuesday, the stunt corner would bring in some guy that did some martial arts that he might have known because it wasn't a big skill set. Everyone thinks martial arts is a huge skill set in stunts. It was very rare to have a guy that took that didn't just take a few classes of judo or karate. There were no specialty martial art guys really back then, one or two top. Uh, it was all car guys or fall guys or horse guys. Very rare to find a martial art choreographer. And again, for the audience, martial art choreography or fight scene choreography has very, very little to do with actual martial arts. You can be a world champion jiu-jitsu guy and suck at choreography. You can be a great choreographer and literally get beat up by a 90-pound girl. Like there, There's really no correlation between the two they're two separate entities one's dance one's combative anyways you would call your buddy up and you'd either choreograph it on the day then you try to show the actor in the double and they'd shoot around what the actor could do around the double and it was very very low low level sophistication yeah. uh so the idea of hanging <laughs> out and literally spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to have 10 stunt guys on for 10 weeks to choreograph a fight scene was fucking unheard of there isn't a producer in town that would have hired 10 stunt guys to choreograph a fight. There, that You would have gotten fired. There, it didn't exist. That's how the Chinese did it. Their fight team would stay, so you'd have 10 guys for four weeks, because that's how you'd fight multiple attackers. And they'd be on, and they'd choreograph the actor. And the, like, the idea of training an actor for six months to do something, unheard of. Didn't exist. Never. Now, a minimal of 10 weeks is required by most stunt teams to train anybody in a superhero movie. And yep. six weeks is considered, oh, that's low, that's low, that's low budge. We don't want to do that. We do 10. In the John Wicks, Keanu's trained for five to six months. But before Matrix, that was not a formula like that. You'd get laughed out of town. So we thought, well, to get the kind of results we got on Keanu, and remember, Keanu was a very athletic guy. He was a semi-pro athlete, hockey player, was already pretty athletic. But Carrie Ann and Hugo and, uh, you know, uh, Lawrence Fishburne were not martial art guys in any way. So to take them and deliver what they did, that yeah. proved the relevance of the concept of what the Hong Kong guys were doing. So we're like, well, we all love martial arts. And up, you got to remember, Dave's a martial artist. I'm a martial artist. A lot of our doubles are martial artists. But until the Matrix, we did one, two fight scenes a year. We were making money as high fall guys or air ram guys or car guys or falling down stairs. There weren't a lot of jobs for martial art guys. And you certainly couldn't survive as just a fight guy. Now, there are stunt guys that only do fights, that will never fall down stairs, never get hit by, never drive, ne don't, probably don't even have a driver's license and can make a great <laughs> career out of just literally fight scenes. So yeah. to take it back to where Dave left off, I got back from Mexico, let's try it. And we're all like, well, we're all pretty good martial artists. And we saw like, fuck it, we'll monopolize the business. We're the best martial art guys, so we'll just yeah. make a martial art team. And then it got good and we started getting jobs and it started working because – after Matrix, everybody wanted to hire the Hong Kong guys, but they didn't speak English and they didn't understand American filmmaking. So we acted as go-between. We could do the stunt coordinating, hang all the wires and assist the Hong Kong team. And then after a while, they just started hiring us instead of the Hong Kong team to do all the work as well. And then comes, what are we? We got up to 300 when we we're doing the movie yeah. 300 with Zach. We started doing that and we're like, fuck it. It's time to really make a company and not just a group of guys on Saturdays. Right. So Dave and I were looking for a building 
and we came across this literally a dirt field where we saw some development going on pulled into the parking lot and went so when's this going to be ready and they're like okay four months we're like okay great we'll be done in 300 so we 300. <laughs> we flew in we had to sign all the paperwork and i think we flew in over christmas we were yeah. shooting montreal so we came back for a mid midterm break and we had to fill in the paperwork and set the corporation and we're like fuck we need a name and we're like okay action explosion stunt guys or we came up with every bad stunt name you can imagine, yeah. and the actual address of the building was 8711 Aviation Boulevard. I know. So like, I, we were like, we'll change it. We'll change it. Just put it on the paperwork. <laughs> and it became 8711 Aviation LLC. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, we said, yeah, we're going out of the shop. We're going out of 8711. And we're like, eh, cool enough. And just out of laziness, we never changed the name. <laughs> that's that's you know, an awesome story. The, the one thing you brought up, Chad, was like that it was never – the producers would not hire a team to choreograph. No, like, there was a lot of education we had to give. Thinking back, like how hard we fought, and I'm not, I'll, I will give us a lot of credit for this, like forcing producers and studios to see, like demanding that, no, we want the training time or we don't want to do the job. And we going, up against the job. The, going up against the system a little bit or like figuring out how to spend the money or like, okay, fine, you know, cut, this and this and this to take that money to prep and train actors to do their stuff and like have a team that choreographs so you're you know you're prepared it was a change of mentality that was an uphill battle for many years you know you'd be like fine we'll give you one week of prep you're like one week of prep like what can you do in that like but you know now now it's funny like that our team members that that you know work on marvel shows or whatever it's just sort of standard they like Say yeah. with the business, like you know, it's back in the day, we didn't we didn't have iPhones. So Dave's right. It was a bit of an educational thing. We had to teach people how to play with the money because they weren't willing to give us. VFX would come in and say, "We need twenty million for a visual effect," and they'd be, "Okay, that's voodoo. We don't understand it." We'd go and say, "We need half a million for ten weeks of prep," and they go, "Nope, too much." You're like, "Okay, well, we got to show you how to spend this." The other thing was like previses or previsualizations. We'd shoot out all the fights for them and edit them on what back in the day was Adobe Premiere or or Final Cut. Um, but you know, we, we didn't have iPhones. We had big VHS cameras. They so had a VCR to VCR back in the day and work our way up from there. But like to, to that point, <laughs> you know, the same kind of what Dave's talking, how to educate a system or change the producer's mentality of where to spend We have to do as directors. Like we're going in to do, you know, an $18 million movie, John Wick. And they're like, well, everybody will tell you how to do it. In order to save money on a low budget show, first thing you go is prep. So we're going to cut out, we're going to cut down to six weeks of prep, and we're going to do this. And we're like, whoa, 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 no, no, we're going to take all this money you save over here, our contingent, and we're going to spend it all in prep. And yeah. what happens, even with big studio, even with two hundred million dollar movies on there, when they start, when it's a two hundred fifty million dollar movie, but they got to do it for two hundred million, you think two hundred million dollars, like holy shit, that should be enough? Nope, never enough. So what every the studio model is always cut prep, save and prep, save in soft money, spend hard money. But you realize. Dave and I were like, well, the only one way we're going to do this, we're going to shoot massive setups, but we're going to do it on prep. Everybody's going to know. So uh, I don't know how Dave does it now, but back even on my last John Wick, it's like cameramen are usually brought in the same week you start shooting or maybe a week out to check their cameras and go. I bring in my camera guys four weeks out and they go to every stunt rehearsal. The DP goes to every stunt rehearsal. The stunt guy, the wardrobe people go to every stunt rehearsal. So I spend probably twice as much money in prep as everybody else not just training the actors, but training the crew. So when we walk on set, everybody knows what they're doing instead of everybody seeing the set for the first time and seeing the fight for the first time and the cameraman. Remember, the best fight scene in the world is great, but if you have a camera guy with a 75 pound piece of metal on his shoulder who's never seen the fight before and doesn't know martial arts and is, you know, got a bad back, you're not gonna get great shots. <laughs> and if you got a guy pushing a dolly on a track with a guy hitting the knobs to try and lift and raise the camera and he's never seen the fight scene before, how do you expect this guy to keep up with the fastest five foot five martial art team on the planet you know you can't the camera guys have to be a massive part of that so to educate the producers and studios to spend the money in rehearsals no one gets that but that's how we get 50 60 setups a day and how we make you know like the john wicks or the atomic blondes why we get good shots and good footage because we actually have time on set to be creative if you ever be on a big set or a big movie you get there and everybody every director's like i gotta make my day i gotta make my day i gotta make my we don't care about making our day we care about making our day good like, if you're always yeah. worried about making 10 setups and you're only getting five, like, you've kind of fucked it. You know, you haven't planned very well. Like, I'm getting 20 or 30 setups a day that I want to get, 
can you always get more? Sure, but at least I know I'm getting good ones because I already have a crew and a, an actor that knows his shit. If you so, get there, just a chaos theory of, yeah, well, don't spend money in prep. There is a lot of times, and this will shock most of the audience out there, there are a lot of people that show up on set and half the crew, including some of the cast and some of the cameramen, have never seen the set or the action piece before. So half the morning is spent just figuring shit out, like, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, what, the ceiling's supposed to fall up? And that's where that's why movies cost and go over so much, and how we do wicks and like, or the atomic blondes or stuff we do in 50, 60 days, where it takes everybody else 100 days. Just, it is. It, it, it's um. It is what we learned from shooting and editing our own stuff for years. The, the stunt viz for sure. Like having a plan. This is what we're doing. We're gonna. We have. A, you just applied it to the whole movie and also being department heads as stunt coordinators, second unit directors, and then working under these directors and seeing the prob- the the successes and failures. Like again, our bandwidth for what's efficient is more than the average director but i'll say this like we're also proving ourselves that prep works because you know additional photography on movies like hobbs and shaw or deadpool or even wick wicks like the first wick no additional photography atomic blonde no additional photography on a movie like that where you have limited resources everyone thinks about well we'll give you money in the back end to fix it if we need to fix it but don't spend any money now and um you know, we didn't need any money to fix it because we had plan. And that's not how movies are made right now. Like they put money aside, studios are worried. They're like, we're gonna have at least a two week reshoot of something. So don't spend any prep, you know, prep, we'll, we'll fix it in the end. You can do it three times or twice as much. Yeah, and then, and then once you get the circus up and running for post, those days cost twice as much because you don't you're not amortizing it out for an entire shoot. So it's like I, a two I, week- I have a question. Yeah. Has it changed with since the two of you now have such a track record and have demonstrated repeatedly that you guys know what you're doing? Can you now make an argument with the studio and say, hey, um, I know you're thinking this, but how about we do it like this? Yep, we make a good argument. <laughs> exactly that. All right, now everybody, everybody knows how to do it. Everybody will tell you how to do it. It's You know, it's the same thing. If you believe one thing, it's hard to get somebody to change their beliefs, man. You just got to show them. So we just put our heads down and just plow through. And trust me, we're, we're, we're 10 times more perseverant than the next guy. <laughs> okay, so I want to... Um, yeah, you can't fight the tradition of cinema. And I think there's always going to be that friction between studio and artist and budgets and but um i think we get a more a lot more credit than most for sure with 8711 with 8711 what is the most prep you guys have done for a show for 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 something mm. outside of like before our our um feature projects like just as second unit directors or i'm curious for for both for either I mean, I'm just curious. Like, know, like, Reloaded uh, Revolutions was a massive amount of prep. Yeah, I would say Reloaded is the all time. I mean, that's like the Hollywood model for how to. Like, there's been nothing that. I, I was a year on prep before even the stunt. I was doing mocap and VFX tests with like the Hong Kong guys a year out. And then six months out, we hired all the stunt doubles and we started choreographing. I mean, that's massive. After that, yeah. I would say either Wick or Ninja Assassin. I mean, Wick for directing. Yeah. First piano but like ninja assassin we took rain and that was probably our biggest yeah no, i mean like overall with the most guys at least martial art wise i mean there's a few bigger stunt ones but reloaded big between the car prep the martial art prep and it was massive never, like, i don't think there's better. anything that compares you're right like even, not even some of the modern name marvel stuff and they just we're i mean we built a fucking practice freeway i mean <laughs> i don't know how you we beat 2.2 miles of freeway in Alameda just to crash, crash the car. Down. I think RA, you know, the Stone Court in charge of all the car stuff, and we'd already smashed 20, 30 cars before we even went to camera. That's just practice. No one does that. Yeah. We, I Maybe mean, Mad Max did it. Maybe Mad Max. Of the but... best martial arts stuntmen in town, you know, prepping Keanu to fight. I mean, that's why it looks so good. I mean, you can't. I, I, I would have to say our prep budget alone. Between the the thirty person driving team, us. I mean, we were probably close to two million just in prep for the stunt team. 
which is bigger than most people. I mean, the overall budget, I think back in the day, I think what we hit seven, almost eight million, which is a massive budget back in the day. Not so big today, but back then it was a pretty big sun budget. It's insane. Um, I, I have to ask you. And I, I, what? No, it's an insane. That's an insane stunt budget for today, even like that's massive stunt budget. Yeah, um, I don't know how much you guys are allowed to say, so I want to caveat with that. But obviously, you have a history with the Wachowskis. Um, was eighty-seven eleven involved with Matrix Four at all, or are either of you involved? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> Lana was very cool when they got up and running for Matrix 4. Uh, they called us, wanted to know if they could um, use our choreography team. So we sent them with John Eusebio, one of our top guys. Um, Jesus, I think pretty much almost all of our entire A team to all our guys are either Dublin Keanu, Carrie Ann, uh, Lawrence, some of the other cast members that are new cast members that are going. Sorry, Lawrence is, sorry, don't, don't. <laughs> Uh, Lawrence is not, uh, not Lawrence Fishburne isn't in Matrix 4, but the, the other cast, the new cast members in it. Um, yeah, no, they were very cool. They asked us to help out with the choreography and some of the physical training for the guys. Uh, I'm helping out a little bit for a sequence. I think Dave's helping out a little bit for a sequence. Uh, they've kind of brought back a lot of the original. <laughs> I, I, I see that smile on yeah. Dave. So, uh, and again, I, I, Lana's come back with a lot of love to have a, I guess, a pseudo family reunion. So that's been really fun. It's been good to see a lot of the crew members again. Um, we just finished what, doing a little sequence in San Francisco before the pandemic started. So, yes, yeah, we, always fun. A lot of us um, saw the visuals of helicopters invading the city, and yeah. it, it it looks like um, it looks like it's going to be a big movie. Uh, it's definitely from what. I, I know of it. It's incredibly fun. And I think if you're a fan of the original trilogy, you're going to you're going to love this. They're coming back with a vengeance. <laughs> I, 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 I have so many questions, but I don't want to get either of you in trouble. So I will move on. Right. Oh, I want <laughs> fifth on any more than that. We are involved, but that's about all we can say. Yeah. So um, Wait, so actually I am going to do a follow-up. Are either of you doing second unit directing or directing certain things or you're sort of helping with stunts? No, it's more about the creative concept of some of the choreography and backing them up with stuff. Um, yeah, I think even other than the, like the Matrixes, most of their stuff, uh, that's, that's a good question actually, Steve. Like Lana, what... What I think makes her so great is like, you know, she directs her own action. You know, I mean, we've had second unit directors on some of the Matrixes and stuff just because of the logistics involved. But of, of late, and especially on Matrix 4, she's directing all her own action. The yeah. second units for them are mostly like establishing shots and some of the more, uh, the B sides of some of the compositions for some locations. But uh, Lana, she's supposed to her own action. Like she weaves it into the care, she weaves it into the main unit stuff, which is why their stuff looks so good. Very, that's where we got it from. Uh -huh. I, I want to jump backwards uh, to the first John Wick movie. A lot of people know, obviously, John Wick now is a Lionsgate movie. It's a massive franchise uh, to the studio. Um, but when you guys were making the first John Wick, you were making it out of the studio system. It was just a real indie movie. Um, so Pretty can you sort of talk about the challenges for the two of you? That was your feature debut. How challenging was it at the time for the two of you to like get the money to make this movie? Uh, I think most of that fell on Basil and Wanick's head, Thunder Road, the, the small production company that owned it. Uh, you know, but like, Jesus, I mean, we were a week out from shooting and we lost, uh, oh, we lost what, one of the gap financers and we were down a million bucks and like literally <laughs> shut the movie down. I think Dave and I had to have a drink with Ken up on the rooftop, and he literally wrote a check to cover the gap. <laughs> yeah, so, he, he, he gave put right. money back in. Well, I, it was always you'd have to talk to like Bowser, but it it was all I remember is they did a fairly good job of trying to keep the problems away from Dave and I. But like I just remember every week, uh, the movie was going to go away. Yeah. And after we went to, I mean, how many pitches did we do? Four pitches, I think, to four of the different studios. But like we were literally turned down by every studio that we went to. You know, it's. It's Keanu uh, being an assassin who kills dozens of people over a puppy. His wife dies of cancer, doesn't have anything to do with bad guys, and it's directed by two, not one, but two crazy stunt guys. So, yeah, it wasn't a great pitch. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I thought the pitch was great. Had a good pitch, the visual but, pitch was great. Yeah, like our pitch was great. Yes, but I think that you're right. When you're looking at the risk, I the risk factor, first-time directors. Day, it's like, yeah, I don't know if we want to invest in this one. Um, you know, but like it's, uh, you know, I'm glad we kind of worked out the way it did. I mean, no one... I mean, no one, no one was looking over our shoulder. No one even knew about the movie when we filmed yeah. it. The, the, um, there was, it was sold, it was, Lionsgate um, International had the property with Basil and sold it. So there was a certain amount of money to make the movie, but from the sales. But when we got into production, we needed that little bit more and we could never really, like, on a, on a $12 million movie, you know, a million dollars means a, a shit ton. And it means whether you can do the movie or not do the movie. You know, a million dollars in a $200 million movie doesn't mean anything. It's a half a day of shooting sometimes. And I think that's why, that's why you struggle on those things, you know? It's like they, we just, no one wanted, no one wanted to come to help Lionsgate get, and Lionsgate Domestic at that point didn't want to help. It was like, it was just an international sales job, remember? Yeah. We came. I think we came back to screen the movie right around the holidays, and it's it is the cut that you see. It's the cut you see in on the Blu-ray. It didn't change at all, and every distributor was there. Every theatrical distributor was there, and not one offer yeah. to buy this movie. Everyone was a pass. Everyone was a pass. Well, we had Basil, we had to his music. credit, got yeah. Lionsgate to come to the table and say, "Why don't you take the domestic?" Because it's your. It was a guy named Patrick Waxberger who actually kind of helped. And then Jason Constantine acquired it for the event. Like, there's a little. Luckily, we had two or three guys that had a little bit of faith in it. <laughs> but yeah, we were turned down by everybody, both before the movie was made and after the movie was made. They said <laughs> it's too slow, too violent, didn't get it. Uh, I think the word stupid was used a couple times. <laughs> this is stupid. So uh, yeah, we got. I, it's I can't tell you it's just fucking luck. <laughs> I, I will. I'm going to share a, a personal story to the movie. Um, Lionsgate acquired it, and then shortly after they acquired it, they invited a few of us, four or five of us, to see the movie at the Lionsgate screening room before there was any sort of thing. And I remember sitting in the theater watching, and there were some executives behind me, and I'm about halfway through the movie, and I'm like, what the fuck am I watching right now? <laughs> and how do I not know about this movie? Because I went in just knowing Keanu played a hitman. And I remember walking out of the theater being shell-shocked by uh, how amazing the movie was, and talking in the lobby with a few people, and obviously, because at the time, people don't realize Lionsgate might have just done straight to Blu-ray. Yeah, it you was know? it was talked about actually. It was this close, I think. I think Fantastic Fest put it over this. Yeah, we we're, were in Austin, right? Austin, Texas. Yeah. If it wasn't for the standing ovation we got there, it would do. We were Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, we, we were right to Blu-ray. Yeah, when the when the online sort of the Twitter started to blow up about it, and people started to you know leave quotes about it, and Lionsgate saw, sh oh my God, like we had no idea. We were actually at Austin. What, what it was a fantastic fest, right? Yeah, yeah. We were there, I think. And last minute, Keanu decided. Keanu wanted to go. We we're like, ah, eh, don't go, dude. We're probably gonna get booed out. Keanu went. <laughs> Keanu and I remember we went in. We gave a quick little hello. I think Dave mispronounced somebody's name, and then uh, yes. we sat like in the front row. We were very close to the Adrian door. Clicky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, or Adrian <laughs> Peterson, the running back. That's okay. <laughs> and we were just like, we remember we put Keanu in the middle, Dave, me, and we're like, look, if, if it gets bad, we're going out that door. And <laughs> I, we really had, I swear to God, we had an exit plan. And then I could, <laughs> we're still sitting there and we're sinking in our seats because it was that. And then they started clapping. And then at the end, everybody stood up and cheered. And we're like, holy shit. And really, that was the first time we actually had hope. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. Um. Oh, uh, so uh, I, when you look back on the film now, is sometimes I talk to filmmakers and there's like a shot or a sequence or something they wish they could tweak. When you look back on the film, is there like, is, are you sort of like it's it's perfect, or do you always look at a certain shot? And this could also be from the sequels or from Deadpool two or anything you've worked on. Do you see that like a, something you always want to change, or are you sort of like, nope, it's done? Um, uh, you can go first. 
I look, we're both perfectionists. I think Chad might, I love, he's my brother. So I'm going to say this. He might obsess over things more than I would, but the, um, and John Wick, generally I'm, I can let things go and I go, the movie is the experience and this is what we got and let's make the best of it. And then you just have to be Zen about that and like, know that that's what that is. But, um, in John Wick, if there was one thing I could change, it's like when they're the firefight outside of the church. I mean, maybe we had like 35 minutes to shoot the whole thing and it still holds up, but it's like, it's not what we wanted. You know, it was like, it was pulling out all of our second unit chops and like, quit three cameras, go here. You run over here, just, just shoot here. You know, like we're losing light. And we, get, and we, it was part of the thing that makes John Wick great is like our appetite was huge. Our budget was small, but our will was like strong. And we just were like, we're going to go for it. We're going to go for it. And so I look at that. Yeah. I'd like to shoot that better, but it's also no one knows. No, I'm with Dave. If you're, if you're, if you're asking if there is a better shot, or if I could choose where I put the Coke can or something, not really. I mean, the happy accidents are what makes it, it is, makes, what makes it what it is. You know, it's a lower budget, fun movie. That's great. But I'm with Dave. Like, it's a learning process. If I could do it again, obviously, it would change a lot of things. I don't know. It's more about, like Dave said, it's more about the big stuff. I wish I would have known how to budget my time better. I wish I would have known where to put that. But, like, no, like, uh, what's fun is I, when we started working on number four, we went back and watched all three in a row. Like, literally, just devoted a day and watched... It's a lot of fucking headshots. But, like, uh, you can definitely see <laughs> things got better, so that's good. But then, you know, of all three, and I, I poured my last six years of my life in all three of those things, I still love the first one the best. You know, I just, that's my favorite. I love moments, and I love the making of the other two, and I love all that stuff. I love doing another one. I love Keanu. I love the crew. I love everything. But, like, the first one just... Because of all the imperfections, because of all the limitations, makes you your best. So would I change anything creatively? No. Would I change something my own self? Ah, I wish I was a smarter guy, but can't change that now. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to ask, Chad, you a specific question. So John Wick 3, to me, has – the stuff with the dogs is so jaw-dropping. Um, and I joked around about it with you yesterday, but, like, have you had any – people be like, fuck you for making these dogs do what they did because how am I supposed to raise the bar on that? That's, uh, I've had a lot of people from some of the, like, what was it, like, Togo and so I have a lot of, talked to a couple other people about the done dog movies and it's always the same. It's this guy, Andrew Simpson, the guy that trained the dogs. The guy that did the wolves for Game of Thrones. He's the one that came at it with the whole thing. I mean, it all started, you know, John Wick was never intended to be a dog movie. You know, it just had a puppy in it. And I forgot how we got that the whole scene at the end of the original John Wick with the with the vet and stuff that kind of got added in, and then yeah. uh, Dave picked the pit bull at the end and we did this and became that and we put it. And then I was like, ah, oh, it's kind of fun, and we, it be over the course of two other movies became a a dog movie. <laughs> and Dave, tell you like I grew up with dogs, but I was a cat person. Dave yeah, was, was I'm the person. dog person. My dog, dog I have three and fries are not here. Yeah. And that was all. Like, I didn't have dog. I didn't want anything to do with dogs. And then Dave brought the dogs. And I was like, oh, fuck, now I'm stuck with this fucking pit bull. And a pit I love our pit bull. The actual dog actually plays him. But like the clumsiest will not hit its marked dog I've ever dealt with. And he's like, just not a good acting dog. So rather than try and train the actual pit bull, we came up with the idea of, uh, you know, when I talked to Andrew, I was like, look, I want to do a dog suit. So Dave and I had five. What was his jumpy? This dog, this Australian Shepherd called Jumpy, who has his own oh. uh, Nickelodeon yeah. show. Yeah. And we saw what Jumpy could do, but Jumpy was this mid-sized dog, and he didn't look very tough. <laughs> so we're like, what's the toughest dog we can find that can actually do stuff? And we're like, a Belgian Malawan. I'm like, okay. But they actually do attack people for the military. We're like, okay, how do we do this and not hurt anybody? And it was Andrew was the one that kind of figured out how to train the stunt guys. But that alone, that's Halle Berry for five months with five Belgian Malawans with 10 stunt guys that the dogs are recognized by smell. So when they bite, they know it's playing and they know it's not to rip out their jugular, you know? Uh, you know, a lot of the, 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 speaking of the dog stuff, a lot of stuff from John Wick were things that, the original John Wick were things that we as choreographers wanted to express for years and nobody wanted, nobody wanted in their movies. Like, you know, gun-fu, nobody wanted it. How many times do we present gun-fu? 
everyone's like, no, nah, no, and they didn't want it. That's too weird. The dog choreography that that Chad and the team and and the trainers like came up with was amazing, and the, and that effort that went into it. But I remember us. There was this push that movie, so much. There was that movie we were trying to circle before John Wick. It may even been a year before, and it was like I can't remember what it was called, but it was like. This guy had this dog, and we were researching parkour dog on the internet, that Russian dog. Yeah. Parkour dog. It was a viral video. I mean, we would watch it and go, we need to do. We got to get that dog. Parkour dog. <laughs> yeah. No one wanted and, uh, the, he was a It was like when the Russian parkour videos were going around. And uh, yeah, this guy had his dog jumping all over the place. And I think that was, I remember. So a lot of times, like, we have these ideas, nobody wants them. And we now we have this outlet. We can put them in our movies, and everyone's like, "Wow, that action's amazing!" I'm like, "Yeah, you could have had it when we were just choreographers, but I, all right, we'll just use it no, in our own films." Kick somebody with a horse? <laughs> no one would let me kick anybody with a horse. I'm like, I get kicked with a horse when I was learning to ride and do like polo shit. A horse kicked me, sent me across the fucking barn. And I was like, I'm putting that in the movie. That's the first thought I had when I regained consciousness. You know, I'm like, I've been trying to get that in. And I was like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna kick a guy with a horse in this one." Yeah, and that sequence and the sequences with uh, the horse in the last one uh, is fantastic. That's Keanu Reeves on a horse. What an image! That's the only thing we said. That's one of the first ideas we ever had for the movie. We're like Keanu, we're putting you on a horse. He's like, cool, western. Keanu, you got it. Of all the actors I work, Keanu was probably the most game. You could tell him I'm going to put you on a rocket ship to the moon. He's like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am down for anything. Well, that I mean. I, I can't say enough good things about Keanu. And also the other thing about Keanu is that uh, he's just the nicest guy. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if we could have done the first John Wick with anybody else. Yeah. It would have been a rough one. He yeah. just never... Super, so supportive of us as directors. And I mean, I think that's how he always is. I mean, he's like a director's actor, but um, you gotta remember the knowledge he has from all the films that he's done. Like he was really... We go up to this guy who's literally a, a full-blown movie star and say, look, you're not going to kick. You're not going to punch. You're just going to throw people. And you're not going to talk for 20 minutes. And you're going to fight a woman in your box of shorts. And you're going to cry over a puppy. You in? <laughs> like, there's not a lot of main dudes that would say, yeah, I'm in. So he didn't even balk. He's like, well, cool. All right. You know, like, didn't miss a beat. Uh, I... I have to ask you, Chad, for all the people that are watching that are fans of the John Wick franchise, um, am I am I mistaken? Were you planning, was the fourth one planning on coming out next year originally, or? Yeah, kind of. That was uh, the whole Matrix same day thing. That was a FUBAR thing. A couple wires got crossed between studios. That was a misquote from someone else about how they're coming out on the same day. Uh, there's we're super interested uh can not like dave will tell you like we did john wick isolatory like that's it that's the movie uh no one was more shocked than we were when they asked us to do a second one and that was done as a single and then okay we did a third one okay that one was meant to be done now we've been asked to do a fourth one. okay like they're all standalone there's no <laughs> i wish i could tell there's no plan <laughs> okay we kind of making it up as we go um but uh, we finished the third one, and Keanu like, okay, time to move on. Let's go do a romantic comedy or something. We're good. Uh, and then we just kind of met each other when we were doing the publicity tour. I think we were in Japan, and we're like, Keanu comes up and goes, I think I got one more left in me. I think I, And we had one idea we didn't use, which we really loved, and we had to cut it out of number three. We just didn't have the space for it. So we're like, okay, we'll do a fourth. That's going to be awesome. We'll make a plan. And, you know, the studio's got uh, – we're with new management now. Like Joe Drake and Nathan Kahane is kind of – kind of taking over the motion picture thing at Lionsgate. And like, we totally get what you guys are trying to do. You know, we submitted an idea or a thematic for number four and it's really big. So, you know, we're talking about doing a little bit more than a four or something like that and trying to develop that. Um, we'll see how that goes. But with the, between how much we want to expand the John Wick, let's just call it a franchise, I guess. And the pandemic, I, you know, I couldn't tell you a release date for the next one. I mean, Keanu Matrix was only what were they, four weeks in, I think, when this all happened. So, you know, Keanu's got to go finish his commitment up on the Matrix, which is a big deal, which will probably, I think, take him to the end of the year. And then we have to go into our prep mode, and then we'll start. So uh, release dates, I'm, I'm sure, with every production from Dave's stuff to our stuff, and develop, like, who knows right now. 
No, no. Yeah, by the way, everyone, anytime I see a studio put a release date out there, I'm like, yeah, really? Like, how do you know that? You know, like. I'm sure it's, I don't, I don't, it's hard to say, you know, but I, I think it's going to be a wacky time when this all gets going, you know? I mean, everybody's going to be scrambling for dates. And who knows, man, maybe like, what, uh, like, I think Tenant is still taking, they're still keeping their date in July. But yeah, like, that's... they do with like the Trolls World Tour, like, what, you stink with Universal, like, Universal released it. Or they're trying to release their movies theatrical and streaming at the same time. Like, that's proved pretty profitable for some people. So, who knows, man? Yeah, I, I guess my last question for you though is, um, where? Listen, where? My, it's a two-parter. But where were you at, or where are you at in the scripting process? And do you feel any sort of pressure because three had just such crazy stuff in it? Like, how do you attempt to try to raise the bar past that in terms of? action set pieces that's a good question um there's been a couple of days when we've woken up i'm sure dave feels it too and everything like we're supposed to be you know you know neither one of us hides from the fact that we were stuntmen like i'm pretty proud of it like you know cool but we certainly don't try to hide it like we're just directors now we don't deal with that like yes i want to make action movies and i think dave and i were both good at what we did as stuntmen and as choreographers so we want to we don't want to lose that i want to be cool with the action and be a, I want to be a better director but that doesn't mean I want to do less act or have less to do with the action um I guess the third one just felt like I needed a place to go after number two and I had these ideas and I you know it kind of became that kind of wacky action movie um you know in answer to your question yeah there's been a couple days where I decided to do number four and I've woken up in a cold sweat going horses how do I beat horses like I I have no fucking idea to tell you the truth um but that's how I think you'll figure it out you, yeah, we've gone into every movie. They, there are times, like, literally, I'll start, and, like, the horse thing wasn't until I, I was, how to figure out how to do the dog thing. Like, I didn't know the dog thing was going to work till we got the dogs to Morocco after a 24-hour flight. I have no fucking idea that was going to work. Who knows how the dogs were going to react after a 24-hour flight with stuntmen with a city full of cats. I had no fucking idea. Like, you kind of roll the dice. You, like Dave says, you go headstrong. You, you have the confidence to swing for the fence. Do I... I have a lot of, I think, really cool ideas for the next one that I think are different and shocking and fun and unique. Uh, how to do them, I have no fucking idea right now. I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> you know, I think, with our like, you, teams, but. And what you always have working for you in the Wick movies is the character so beloved that, you know, when you're putting them in the peril, uh, those set pieces are amplified. And th 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 that's not to say that they're just conceptually they're not they're not strong on their own but you have john wick in the middle of them and so it allows you a freedom with what you can do uh the way he expresses himself in choreography but also um people are rooting for him so they just have that much more impact and now this is going to be like a fourth installment like people come back for the fourth and or you know whatever number of installments you guys end up doing like that just proves they're going to love them even more. So, And it's multidimensional. You can choreograph cool moves. You can choreograph cool moves in a cool set piece. You can choreograph a cool set piece with cool moves with a cool bad guy. You know, there's a lot of variables. Like, you know, if, if back in the day I had John Wick, you know, fight Jet Li in a burning temple with spaceships, yeah, that's okay. You can build that shit right up, you know? So there's a lot of, it's not just about that. But, like, the common denominator is, like Dave said, it's not even the John Wick, it's Keanu Reeves. I got Keanu. I got a guy that's willing to go down any road. I got a guy that's naturally emphatic. Like he you know, he loves loves what he does. People love him, wacky character, and we're an original IP, so I don't have to there's no comic book mythology behind him that I have to, you know, like, you know, my guy can do anything. Like there's no he can't do this, he can do this, he can only use his shield, he can only use his trident, like I can do anything. If I decide John Wick wants to, you know, shoot RPGs out of his ass, great. You know, I, I don't think that's the world I'm going to go down. But like, there's no restrictions. I got, I got an idea for you. Underwater. I'm there. Mark, I already give it. Was that a secret? Yes. Thank you. Shit. That's sorry. Good. Good. <laughs> I was just fucking with you, dude. I was just fucking with you. Going to make Thunderball look like it was a pool party. I love it. Uh, I love it. I'll be there. Yeah. Um. Uh, <laughs> 
I was going to open up a different door, but um, David, I, I have a, an individual question or two for you. Um, there's been some talk about a Atomic Blonde sequel yes. and rumored at Netflix. Um, be a brunette in this one. Wait, what? <laughs> She's going to be a brunette. That's that's the second part. Atomic <laughs> Blonde, Atomic Brunette. It's a series. Um, is there is there any what what's the status of an atomic I don't, honestly i don't know you know it was a property that we didn't fo fully control and i think that um now that netflix has it they're they're having initial conversations and um you know we'll we'll see i don't i honestly don't know a lot about it um i just know that they're interested in in pursuing it and it's in its initial sort of phases and it's exciting to think that, you know, that that world could go on, like Wick would go on. And, um, but again, it's like really early talks. Sure. My, my next thing is obviously with the Fox being acquired by Marvel, um, mm -hmm. you know, who knows what's going on with a Deadpool three, but I'll ask you, um, is there, do you know anything about a Deadpool three? Would you be involved? I don't, I don't know. Again, like, I don't know anything about it. And, um, I don't know if I would be involved. I, I hope, I hope, I mean, look, I, I love that world so much. And like, it was such a fun experience and like, like Wick or like Atomic Blonde, where you have this world where you can kind of go anywhere. I mean, less so Atomic Blonde. It was more like revisionist history style mashup. But um, with Deadpool, like it's literally all bets are off. You can go as gonzo as you want. And then working with Ryan, who's such a, you know, creative uh, comic mind and um it's just so fun so uh yeah if it happens i'd love to be involved I, again i think marvel's kind of doing their thing and figuring out what they want to do with all these things that they control and um hopefully we'll know something soon but i really don't know anything i'm gonna i'm gonna jump back over to chad for a second i think for the last 10 years i'm joking about that time frame um i've been asking you about a certain highlander movie um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw it out there again. Obviously you're hard at work on John Wick 4, but yeah. has there been any movement on Highlander? Could this thing actually get made? Yes, we're, we've, yes. We are currently revising the script. We have a writer that's very active on it, doing now I think the 90th version. Uh, but yes, I, I tell you, if I ever get tired of shooting people in the head, I'm gonna go to chopping off heads, I promise. I promise you, we're gonna make this movie. We're we're heavy in development on it. It's like probably right now, I'd spend at least at least half my days on Highlander right now on developing it and stuff. And it it's a massive thing because there's a big plan to stretch it out and do do a whole universe with it and and really develop the Immortals and all the stuff that we love about the the original film and how to build that out. It's Dave and I were after that movie seven years ago. Geez, before yeah. John Wick and stuff. It's we something trying. I think is really fun. It has big opportunities. It's just, you know, I, I, to, to say I've been preoccupied with the Wick isn't really fair. Like, I love the John Wick universe. I love it all. I love Keanu and stuff. I spend about half my days mulling over Highlander, and then the other half of the day is either Wick or anything else. But, like, I, I can only say to your audience, I promise I'm going to make it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> first chance I get, uh, I... Every one of my crew wants to make it. If you go into our offices, 90% of the office is covered in Highlander shit and pictures and schedules and stuff. And then I got this little John Wick corner. I feel like I'm dying to make this movie. Uh, I can't even tell you. So it's it's actively heavy in development, and it's in my head, and I can't wait to do it because I think I think we really have a good idea for it. And it would be uh, epic. It's a great it's a great movie for I know that. Hopefully before I retire, it, 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 I'm really hoping. <laughs> and yeah, I, that I, I, could be massive and cool. And I mean, I would expect nothing less from him on that property. Yeah. Like, it's awesome. I was, I was going to say, because something with the swords in Highlander is, if you don't get this thing off the ground, I beg you to introduce the sword stuff hardcore into the Wick universe. Oh, it's, yeah, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> You came in and saw what we have for, for number four. Yeah, it's pretty epic. Uh, you won't be bored. Keanu's got a lot of work, too. That's the, that's the only one that walks in the office and kind of bows his head a little bit. He's like, I got to learn what? I'm like, yeah, good luck. He's got a lot of work. 
I'm going to switch back over to David. Um, uh, recently, Dwayne Johnson talked about uh, in development on Hobbs and Shaw too. Um, so uh, I like th I like throwing it at you. Empty with the same answer. I wish I knew. Like it's funny. <laughs> like I want again. I like I had fun making that movie, but these these are very different. Like yeah, there's a lot of moving parts, and like he's been talking about it, but been talking to a lot of other people. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, I haven't. I have not heard much about it, and I and I, I haven't heard much from. Did we lose Dave? I was like, what, did, what just happened with uh, with David? <laughs> Is it, did when we? He, uh... When he comes back, I'll tell him Dwayne's been talking to me about Hobbs and Shaw. <laughs> Dave, can you hear us? Are you frozen? I wonder if, uh, hold on. Oh, wait. Uh, hey, Thad, I know you're watching this thing. Is it possible to get him back? <laughs> he was like, I'm not talking about Hobbs and Shaw, too. Fuck that. You hit him with too many questions about sequels, Steve. <laughs> hey, listen, this, but you know what's funny? The, the audience, everyone who's watching right now, these are things that people really want to know. Of course, no, that's great. Okay. Like, it. Hollywood can be so crazy, and when you go, like, you know, sometimes people forget, for Dave and I to do something original or try to keep the action where you gotta go, like, most directors can get, not most, let me just say, there's a whole directing contingent that within six months can get up and running, so they're devoting a year, year and a half. For us, like, it's two years a show. Yeah. You know what I mean? To do Wick, do something original, to train the cast, to get dogs, like, or to Dave to find location, it's like, it's pretty epic. So, you know, say you did like, okay, Bob's action movie one, and I get done with it, and it takes me two years to do that, but I'm also involved in the next in line one. Like, say I was going to do Highlander next, the student, they don't have any choice but to go get somebody else. You know, if they want to keep the train on the tracks and keep the franchise going, that's why sometimes directors rotate, or you won't see a director doing two, three, and four all together. Or you'll see somebody like me, or like Richard Donner, or Spielberg, like Cameron, like we, we love our franchise, we want to live in that world because we know what we're doing. But to have a decent director schedule, fucking tough you know what i mean because actors have other things there's so many moving parts to a film you're attached you're unattached you move on you trade it's like y your schedule is never ever locked until you start rolling camera it's just a, it's a mind-numbing thing and it freaks you out a little bit until you actually get to that spot you know oh, completely and, and a lot of people behind the scenes don't realize and i've learned this over the last few years the importance of scheduling yeah. And how you might have an actor, and then if you move production a week, you lose that actor for the whole yeah. shoot. And then the whole show falls down because your finances are based on that actor, and you wrote the script for that. And everybody, every new person, every new time you add a new working part, it's a whole ripple effect. Pretty massive. Yeah, hey, I'm getting a message uh, so I can tell Thad and you. Um, uh, his uh, David's internet went down, and he's trying to get it back up. Great. Let's so see. We're, just, we're uh, just gonna we're gonna kill a few seconds. Um, so Thad, I know you're hearing this, watching this. Um, so hopefully we can call him back, or he'll call us back, and we can make this thing happen again. Um, hopefully. So I'm gonna actually, I'll hit you up with a question you didn't answer, um, which is, where are you in the? And this is again about Wick Four, but where are you in the scripting phase? Do you have like a draft you're super happy with? We have, we have, uh, you know. I won't. I wouldn't call it a first draft. But we call it like a scriptment. It's a written out story, part outline, part script, part thing. We know where we want to go. We know the thematics. We know. We call it like the toy box. We've got a bunch of scenes. It's probably two. It's like a hundred and something page document, but it's, some of it's written. So like, it's a good place to start. And then we start thinning it out. And then we work with the writers to to get the right scenes. And we start working with Canada's dialogue. It's a very outward in process for us. Um, and then we'll do the inward out process, which is about character. So to answer your questions, we're, 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 I'm in a happy place where we are in development. Like we've gotten, not quite, I would say, locked in first draft, but we're in a place where we, we know what we want to do and where we want to do. And here's Dave, so I don't have to talk. Sorry, <laughs> oh, man, way to hold down the fort. Yeah. Sorry, uh, it is true. I just they also are we just got off <laughs> Dwayne Johnson offering us <laughs> Hobbs and Shot too. <laughs> You guys should definitely do it. I recommend that Chad should take a hop to swing. Hard, too hard of an act to follow. I'm good. <laughs> Actually, but, but, but being serious, David, 
I am so proud of that movie. I had so much fun, actually. It it cracks me up every time I watch it. And by the way, there's this crazy uh, world-ending virus theme that you knew. <laughs> well, the thing I am curious about being serious is, well, first of all, I want to say congrats on Hobbs and Shaw because Thanks. even though it's connected to Fast and Furious, you were still launching its own franchise and doing original stuff like, you know, like pulling the box office that it did is really hard to do. Thanks. I mean, I look, you do have the underlying IP of the the brand name of Fast and you got Dwayne and Jason that are big global stars. But um, I I think we I'm proud of how we serviced it and I'm proud of how we separated it from the original franchise and made it its own thing and made it more fun and hopefully accessible to a, a newer audience, a different audience as well. So um, we, we had a blast and we and it, the the most fun I had on it was like putting together like the who's who of stunts because there were so many set pieces that were massive. Like we were prepping the, the scene in Hawaii and I had like all of our contemporaries who are car guys like Chris Palermo, Jay Fry, Chris O'Hara, like all prepping that stuff <laughs> while we're still shooting in London with the martial art team, you know, of like the who's who of martial art guys. And so it's like, when you have those resources, you can kind of have fun and play with all your friends and, and do something special. So it was great. So I've, I've asked you about all these sequels, which you may or may not be involved with, because <laughs> who knows? So what, what, being serious, what is your next project? Do you know? I don't. I mean, I think that this, um, the world situation, I might have known, but I think that the world, um, you know, with the situation and schedules changing, there's a lot of things that I have in development and like, um, is there something that is a little bit more friendly that could get started sooner and get my team working? Would I lean into that potentially, you know, getting a script prepared for something like that? Um, and then there are a lot of things that we're, we've, sorry, my dog, we've acquired lately that um, could, could come up quickly, who knows? So I, I don't know. It's not, um, it's crazy times. So I don't know exactly. Chad, what's your next movie? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think we're gonna stay with, you know, fortunate that we have the John Wick thing. Uh, Lionsgate, uh, they've never been more helpful and supportive of what they're trying to do. So uh, we're, we seem to be pretty locked in schedule-wise with Keanu's schedule, just contingent on when he finishes Matrix. Um, you know, we haven't talked about release dates yet, but like, I would like to knock John Wick four out as fast as possible. You know, uh, as long as you know Keanu survives the training for Matrix and the training for us. Uh, luckily, it's the same stunt team, so that helps. But it's like when you know the question is when can you go back? And yeah. Keanu's got to do the Matrix, and what what are the Matrix's problems with logistics? It's more of like the world is so kind of in flux right now. Um, you never know. You could sneak in Highlander beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I lost Chad for my screen. Is he here? He is. <laughs> okay, so you can hear me. I can hear you and I can see you. Okay, now we saw you again. Okay, right. cool. So I'm going to switch it up because um, I have a few Twitter questions that are aimed at the two of you. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. So the first question is, um, and this is all from Twitter, if the two of you got in a fight, who would win? Uh, it would be probably a lot of ice and lots, lots of stitches. It would be rough. It'd be, it'd be an unequivocal, unfair, unadvantageous draw. <laughs> I would do you agree? Chat might be more sadistic. That's all I'm going to say. No, no, no. <laughs> we, I think it... We, we, we have brothers. We've had our sparring sessions in the past, and it's always yeah, sort of like... Yeah. All, our guys, all our guys are good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you guys have um, a favorite John Wick kill? Ooh. Favorite John Wick kill. I do. What's your favorite John Wick kill? The heart, the uh, Danny Hernandez and the... Oh, um, yeah. ...floor in John Wick 1, where he's like... <laughs> Putting the knife into his chest. 
Yeah, that's, I would go that one. I would go the the first John Wick kill with the stomping on knife in the hallway, and I really like the 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 book kill in number three. So one of those. That's one of fun. The, yeah, I like the fun ones, the ones I, that I, are tested. Yeah, the, the book kill in the library is fantastic. In the third one. Hold um, on. I, you know, it is a it's kind of a derivative of him in the kitchen, in the first one where he drags him to the which. Chad choreographed in the last five, right before we were shooting it. We're like, it's not feeling right. It's not feeling right. We'd rehearsed it for a week with the guys. And then he's like, I would just like pull him here and like, bam. And we're like, hey, visual effects, can we break his neck in CG? And they're like, yeah. Remember that thing? Yeah, a lot of it's pretty hack, man. <laughs> the audience is going to learn how unsophisticated we really are. Like, stealing your own steps. Yeah. Good. Um, for the two of you, uh, again from Twitter, uh, what was your main inspiration to move from stunt work to becoming directors? Uh, getting too old to get hit by cars. <laughs> no, I, it was a creative thing. It just felt good. I think Dave was wanting to direct. I love second unit directing. I liked all that stuff. And then Dave was really into directing. I think you'd, what, you remember that Momoa thing, the vampire movie? Yeah. Dave was really, <laughs> Dave was already doing lookbooks and like going out on pitch meetings and stuff. And honestly, it just felt, for me, I can't speak for David. It just felt, I don't know, it felt like it was a funner way to go. It felt like it was more expressive creatively. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I mean, I really wanted to, maybe earlier than Chad, like we, I was looking to direct and like try to get control and tell stories with our action and that, but also work with, you know, develop some characters. And I, I was excited about it. And I think when John Wick, the opportunity came up, um, you know, for us to work together was actually a really good thing. You know, had looking back, like had we done it separately first out, we wouldn't have had the, you know, creative tension. Yeah, and the the oh. support. You know, like the support you need when you have the onslaught of a first time movie just bearing down on you with no resources. Like it was tough with two of us. I couldn't imagine doing it alone for the first time with all, I mean, it just was problem after problem after problem. So. Yeah. Um, would either of you like to direct a drama or pure comedy? Um, I do the draw. Dave's much more comedic, at least understanding comedy. <laughs> I'm not a very funny guy. Um, but he yeah, it's just very funny. Actually, he just doesn't think he's funny. John Wick is full of humor, dude. Like, yeah, well, it's not supposed to be. That's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean it to be. People just laugh, and I don't know why. Um, uh, honestly, I, I wouldn't mind. It's just like there's no like we talked about when Dave went on hiatus. There, like you know, every movie seems to be like a, a, a two years out of your life. So I want to do Highlander, and I want to do John Wick, and it, it just. Maybe like Dave's saying, like, if you had an oasis of time and you'd knock off something that was really interesting, yeah, there's a lot of topics that interest me. I don't know if I'd be good at it, but I'd like to try at some point, you know, after action retirement, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm the same. Like, I would love – I wouldn't I, – I don't look at – when we read scripts now, I don't look at, like, oh, my God, it's got to have, a, you know, crazy set pieces or things like that. I just want to tell good stories that I know they're going to connect with. The the fact of the matter is, if it was a small contained drama in a room, Chad or myself would probably find a way to put a fight scene in it. <laughs> so let's be honest. But um, it doesn't mean I mean we're not interested in directing those things. I know I am. It'd be fun if if it's the right material. Sure. If someone is out there right now interested in getting into Hollywood, doing stunt work. Work like working at eighty seven eleven. Um, uh, what would you recommend that people do who are you know younger who want to get into the industry? Um, one is, I would say, be very honest with yourself about what the job is. I, I, very few times have we ever met a younger and older person who want to be into movies or stunts that understood what stunts were. Stunts is not Hooper. Stunts is not being the best martial art guy or knocking people out. Stunts is not. You know, being the wild man with your car, it's, you have to be incredibly smart, you have to be incredibly athletic, you have to be, like I said, like most people don't even understand that when we do fight scenes, being from a martial art background absolutely helps, but that doesn't necessarily make you a great fight guy or a great stunt guy. There's a whole thing of the business of performance, it, you know, it's acting, it's everything, you have to understand camera, just 
really try to get your head around about what you want and then work to that skill set. It's like Hemingway says, you want to be good at writing? Study everything but writing. It's the same thing, you know? For stunts, study everything. You got to know camera, you got to know editing, you got to know story, you got to know acting, you got to know all this stuff. You got to, you know, watch movies. And if you don't know how they did something in a movie, find out. If you see a guy fall downstairs in movies, know that you're probably going to have to fall downstairs. You're going to have to do fights. You're going to have to, like, you got to try and understand the job. And after that, yeah, I mean, you know, stunts, uh, again, we're only talking from Dave and I's level, like Apex, Tier 1, a lifts guys. Like, you're competing against Olympic athletes, X-Men guys, you know, YouTube sensations, professional athletes from every walk of life, and lifelong or, or you know, people that's father's father's father has been a stunt guy. I mean, you're competing as A-list athletes. So be honest with yourself about why you want to do it, what it is, are you willing to understand? And it's, you know, no one cares how many push-ups you can do. It's can you do what we need to do and perform on camera? So understand the job and work your way towards the job. And if you really, really think you've, you've got it in your, in your head, in your heart, then, you know, hey, we're pretty easy to get a hold of. <laughs> you know, get Steve at Collider to give us your phone number and, like, you know, and then, you know, we'll talk to you. <laughs> easy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had this uh, when Chad and I were coming up. We, you know, would, it was like anything in the film business. It's hard to get in. Like whether you want to be an actor, they say it takes seven years. If you want to be anything in the business, it's a it's a very very tight knit community, and it's hard to break your way in. But we didn't ever, and this is not to brag about ourselves or anything, but we kind of had this motto that we learned at a diner once we went to where there was a woman preaching to her fellow patron in the diner right behind us. And she was like, listen, preparation plus opportunity equals miracles. You gotta be prepared because when God gives you the opportunity, if you're no good, you never get it. And like we, Chad and I would joke about it, but we would go and train gymnastics. We would go rock climbing. We would learn rigging. We would buy equipment. We would prepare ourselves to, and try to learn the craft. So we got, got the opportunity, we were, an asset to the stunt coordinator as opposed to, hey, I want to be a stuntman and then you got to train this kid from ground zero. And um, the industry's changed a lot and like we do recruit specialty people and I, like now we're more martial art focused and a lot of guys come in and they're already at a high level. Like Chad said, Olympic athletes, champions, and but they still work their butts off and if they don't, then they don't make it. And it's not you know, you've got to prepare so when, you're, when your time to shine happens, you're there. And if your time doesn't happen, then that's the fate thing that you can't control. But you can control your skill set. There's no, you know, you're the vacuum cleaner salesman. You bang on a door going, you know, if you show up with a shitty vacuum cleaner and a shitty pitch and you're in shitty shape, you're not, <laughs> I'm not going to buy your vacuum cleaner. You got to like, David, you got to make, make me look good. So if you come to us and say, hey, we want to be on your stunt team, teach me everything you know, I don't know anything, that's not a great pitch. So you want me to put all my time and energy into you and you're not, you can't even do a pull-up. I don't know what to say. But if you show up and you've already got a great skill set and you've got great heart and you're willing to learn, like you, you got the good vacuum cleaner and you're ready to put your time, okay, you know, you're an asset or you're, at least we see potential in you being an asset. That's all. So be as prepared as you can for the opportunity. And when it comes, realize that you're probably not going to be prepared enough, but you're going to be open to the to the concept that you're not prepared and you're going to work your ass off to get prepared. Yeah. Um, I, I know I'm super running along in this, and I know, David, you really have to go, but I, I have two last things I really want to talk to you guys about. Number one, I speak for a lot of people, and I think Brad Pitt brought it up at the Oscars, um, and a lot of people out there want to know what the fuck is it going to take to get stunt work recognized in award season uh, because of the skill that it is? Well, I think that there, there are a lot of great people working on it internally. I know that, um, you know, inside of the academy, um, there's a there's a group of, you know, veteran stunt performers that have been um slowly becoming members at large. And hopefully um, Greg Smurz is really spearheading a lot of that. And hopefully they're gonna have enough members at large where we can have our own division inside the academy. And then maybe we're, you know, maybe a step away from officially asking for um, a our own sort of award. I think, look, for me, how we define that award, I think that's up for debate. And I think everyone has a slightly different opinion, but we'll have to get unified soon. I just think it's 
out of respect. Like every year when you watch our contemporaries in every department celebrate film and the cinematic experience, it just feels weird to be left out of that when we're so, we're as important as makeup or hair or special effects or visual effects or, and I'm not like, we're not more important. I think we're as important. And I just think it's a, it's more about getting the recognition and allowing us to celebrate with our peers and celebrate cinema and, you know, and how important we are to it. Just to be blocked out of it is so odd to me. <laughs> so that's my, my opinion. No. Hope, hopefully we're close. And I, I think, um, you know, there's more awareness every year. And I think it's, you know, there's a lot of people working hard to make it happen. No, I, I agree with Dave. Number one, I'm all for it. I think the major, uh, I don't think, it, it's hard because a lot of people don't understand. Like if you have a wardrobe supervisor, that's the head of the department. If you have a production designer, that's the head of the department. If you have a cinematographer, that's the head of the department. Uh, I'm all for stunts someone to get an Oscar. I think we're a big part of it, if not one of the biggest parts, but especially in the visuals in some of the biggest movies out there. My problem is, okay, who do you give it to? Who walks up and gets that statue? Can anybody give me an answer? That's where I think everyone is got problems. Everyone's fighting the question of should, I, I don't think anyone I don't think anyone fights us that we shouldn't get one. I don't I've never heard even an academy member tell us that we shouldn't get one. The question is always who do you give it to? Okay, is it the stunt coordinator? Okay, that's great. Let's give it to the stunt coordinator. On um, the first Matrix, was it so you want me to give the Oscar to Glenn Boswell, not Young Wu Ping? Okay, or what if there's three stunt coordinators? Or what if all three stunt corners are great? What if you got something like Nightcrawler? So you got our stunt corner that did the pipe ramp, but the overall vibe of the movie was from the director. Because he's a fantastic writer. Like all action doesn't necessarily come from the stunt coordinator. It could come from the fight choreographer. It could come from the second unit director, like Spiros Autos. He's very rarely the main stunt coordinator, but he is the guy that does every massive car chase out there. So you're gonna give it to him on the Fast and Furious, or you're gonna give it to the guy in first unit that's babysitting. Not to diminish that guy, but like, okay, people don't realize because stunts are so big on the big movies out there, there's three or four different, we're a fractured department. The, the fight choreographer on a big fight movie doesn't work for the stunt court. He's his own department. But that what's, you know, like, who do you want to, like, if well, it's I, very, I, 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 you give it to Terry Leonard. I think this is, I think that's where it's hard. I think in terms of like the community will have to figure that out. But I think that, again, like it's not, if you could, we, you can't in the academy give it to an ensemble. I think what SAG does is great. It's like best stunt ensemble because then you're including all the creative elements that go into it. But if, as a first step, at least for me, and Chad may disagree, it's that if you gave it to the coordinator, whether it was the right coordinator or the wrong coordinator, the first unit coordinator, second unit coordinator, but if you gave it to the main unit coordinator, it was symbolic that the movie had great action. And then he ultimately would have to give credit where credit is due. That would, or he or she would have to give credit where credit is due because that's kind of how the rest of the departments do it. I mean, you know, there's editorial, there's sound, there's 50 designers working on things, but somebody gets the award. It's really recognizing stunts first and then we'll figure out. Cause again, like I get it, like we do, as choreographers, you do a lot of heavy lifting and the coordinator is administrative sometimes. And other times the coordinator's like right in there measuring the ramp. And it just depends like, I, but I, I think it'd be a step if we got the department head at least the award, so. Yeah, I, I, I think you actually both, I think, I think you both bring up excellent points. And I, I think what Chad, you're saying about where does the award go? I mean, these are excellent points, but ultimately, um, for, just for me as the outsider, I, I think that it is long overdue. And I just want, you know, as a fan, I want some recognition of the people that are doing this unbelievable work, you know? Um, here's my here's my last thing for you guys. Um, uh, recently, like you look at 1917, there I mean that movie was incredible in terms of the, the like the long one or if you will, making the movie look like one shot. Um, in Extraction, which just came out, Sam Hargrave pulled off this 12 minute one -er. and uh, there's been a lot of movies recently that have really pushed the one -er. Um For each of you, is that something that you are actively looking at in terms of 
how do I use this in my storytelling in the future? Or is it sort of like what we're doing? Like, well, let me just start with that or ask that. Dave, you can go. Yeah, no, I, uh, we, you know, we did the Warner in a comic blonde, which is the, which is funny because that, um, confronting my stunt team to choreograph that was like pulling teeth, <laughs> you know, and Sam was the main choreographer on that and the stunt coordinator. And I said, like, you know, he's like, we'll never do it. We're going to cut it up. You're always going to never actors won't be able to hold the shots. Like, give me and I'm like, just do it. And for me, why it was important in that film was that we were staying with the character at the right time in the movie where I wanted the audience to not, I wanted the audience to connect with her and her desperation and how, and not leave sort of the performance of her. Like, because I knew like, look, I had an Academy Award winning actress. I'm gonna hang this section of the movie squarely on her shoulders and we're not gonna cut away. And I'm gonna make it disturbing. And that was a creative choice. For the gimmick of it all, I'm not that, interested in finding it to outdo anybody and making it longer or more spectacular when it makes sense to the story or to the drama or to make a point. Um, yeah, storytelling wise, then yes, I'd look at it. But again, like I don't, it's a gimmick, but I don't think staying with the character is what it worked for me and like building the tension it was and the unnervingness of being with the character in that. So. Before you answer, Chad, I, I also, I just effed up by not bringing up Atomic Blonde. As you started answering, I'm like, and I didn't bring up Atomic Blonde. So I felt stupid. Okay, anyway, Chad. No, no but that, that, and it's funny, but I wanna say this, that my team challenging them, then they came back and like started to choreograph the shit out of it. And I'm like, see? And then we were all, even on that, you know, cause Sam was a big part of that. Like, we were all wondering if we could pull it off at that time, because it is like, you're dealing with actors and like, you're going to do multiple takes to make the stitches work. And it's like, is this going to, how am I going to get the camera from here to here? So going through that process was really fun. And that's what making movies is all about. Like bold, bold choices, like working with the Wachowskis. Go ahead. Yeah, no, Eddie, you're dead. I say it's in the retrospect. Okay. So let's just take, let's, let, let's look at one that we all know. Children of men. Okay. It was a camera gag, but it was also a character gag that shocked you. You got done in retrospect. No one goes, that was a great one Everyone just said, that was a great shot. You get it. He walks into the coffee shop. He walks out. It blows up. It had a heavy emotional impact. What you're commenting on about why it was great was the emotional impact. You weren't commenting that, oh, they fooled you. Like, let's go to 1917. You got to ask yourself after every one shot, when it's done, did you just, I mean, a lot of people go, you see that one shot? Oh, my God. Like, that's a gag. Okay, like. Feel like, did I feel anything, or would I have felt more if I was in a close up? Was it was one take? Like that's the best thing you can say is it's a one -er. Okay, it wasn't a one -er. It was stitch, and I we all like let's just get this out of the way. I will always respect the technical side of filmmaking. It could be the worst movie ever, but if it was technically difficult, like some people don't like Speed Racer, I respect that movie just on a technical level that it's the hardest thing I've ever seen done. Okay, I think it's far harder than doing what they did in 1917. I think it's far harder what they do with a lot of one take. Awesome. But 1917, love the effort went in. I've seen all the behind the scenes, I get it. We've done many things like that in our career in second unit, awesome, love it. But how many of those scenes could have been better if he had cut? I think at least half that movie could have been better by cutting and showing the actors' faces and getting more drama out of it. I think there's a lot of scenes in that movie that didn't land that well because they sacrificed coverage and acting and finding a moment because they wanted to stay in a one -er. Like, that kind of gets me. And I like the movie, but I think at the end of the day, what did you sacrifice to hold the wonder gag? I mean, did you, after an hour in, did you care it was a wonder anymore? I, I didn't. I just wanted to see the movie. I want. I was, you had me, I liked the character. Let me, show me more. Let me see their faces in the tunnel. Like, I didn't think the gag surpassed what could have been. If you do something and like, okay, so you have Tony Ja, I guess, and Tom Young Goon going up the stairs, you can even tell by the end of the take, that fucking guy who's one of the best martial art performers at the time is fucking exhausted, but you're trying to see what craziness is next. So it's part gag and part shock. You do Atomic Blonde, it's because you're showing Charlize do the thing and it's Charlize, okay? Now, at what point does that become redundant? Like, what are you trying to say with your one -er? If you're just doing it because I got no other creative ideas, but I'm gonna do a one -er, and the audience is gonna love me. Like, I, no one gives a fuck, I don't give a fuck. I, I, 
I get the technical side, but like, okay, make me laugh, shock me, make like, what's the residual impact of that one? And if you nail it, and if you think that you couldn't have done it better with cuts, okay, you get my vote. If you just done because ah, I'm gonna, you know what? This is where we're gonna do the one because so and so did the one. Dave Leach did the one and you know this guy did the one and he did it, and we're gonna do a one and it's a guy coming on camera like, okay, cool, I get it. It's tricky to do oneers, and everybody knows about hidden stitches now, and I get it. But could you have done it better? Could you have been more creative? I always ask that. If you get done with a one I'm like, holy fuck. You know, that scared the shit out of me. Like in a horror movie, like with the mirror and you come back, like what was the one in Contact? They did a great little one with a couple little visual gags, but you barely noticed it was a one because it was so cleverly done with Jodie Foster in the mirror. And like, that was killer. But no one ever goes, that was a great one No, you just go, that was a fucking killer shot. That was awesome. <laughs> like that's that's the test of a one so sure. if you like whether it was Birdman or 1970 or something like that, like look, I get the technical achievement, kudos, hat tip, it's all great. But is that the only thing you want people saying about your thing? Yeah. Did it make you feel better? Did it make you feel more? Well, it's like, but I, I don't put it to winners. It's like it's a cool shot. Like you know, stunt guys. Our biggest problem when we get into directing is like it's a cool shot. We're gonna put the camera down low. What is it? Okay, great. It is a cool angle, but you, you got to be more. The director's more than angles. You know, so if you say something with the angle, you get something out of the overall scene of the ambiance on center, the synergy of the whole effect, great, you've nailed it. Like you gotta use camera as a tool and as a device to get somewhere. But if it's if the if the purpose of the oneer is the oneer, I, I okay, cool, that's a creative choice. Don't expect me to bow over for it. But like I've seen guys do it in better ways with a couple cuts. Raiders of the Lost Ark didn't have any oneers in it. One of the greatest movies ever made. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> kill my I, men. I I could, them. Raiders of the Lost Ark. No one is it. Best movie ever made. <laughs> I understand. I should listen, use the one. Don't use it as a gag. Use it to get what you're trying to get across. It, and then do respect. If it if it assists the storytelling. Yep, you're great. It. Any any so, camera gag is awesome if you use it that way. I could spend another 90 minutes talking to you guys about oneers and what you just brought up. And by the way, Chad, I respect the fuck out of you for how honest you are and not holding back on anything. Um, but I know, David, you have to go, and my phone has been blowing up because I think publicists are like Steve. He said it was gonna be 40 minutes, and it turned into, I don't know, the whole day. Right. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, and I, I mean this seriously, um, thank you both so much for being on this uh, very long conversation. I also wanna say thank you to everyone who's watching or will watch in the future. Um, and I really do hope that um, you are both making another movie in the or behind the camera really really soon and thank you so much for today thanks, thanks steve see you buddy thanks steve listen right. have a fantastic day thank thank you all right see you guys later <laughs>